Welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. Speech recognition has become a popular part of daily life. It's not uncommon to see people using their phone assistants to ask questions or complete commands. A study from 2022 found that about half the people in the United States use voice search at least once daily. But what happens if you have non-standard speech? Enter VoiceIt, an iOS and web-based speech recognition app for people with speech disabilities, disorders, and impairments. VoiceIt learns each individual's speech patterns for communication with others. In this interview, we talked to Dr. Rachel Levy all about VoiceIt, including when to use the iOS versus the web app, how the app is being used in people's daily lives, and the impact the app has on independence. So let's dive right in. Welcome back to the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Rachel Levy, the Customer Service Manager and Practicing Speech Pathologist from VoiceIt. And we're going to be talking all about VoiceIt and all the great work that they're doing today. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. So just to start us off, let's talk about the inspiration behind actually designing the VoiceIt software. What was the inspiration? So actually, one of our co-founders, Danny Weisberg, his background is in technology, and his grandmother had had a stroke. And that was a devastating time for him and his family, mostly because they couldn't communicate with her and couldn't understand her. And he discovered that the only person who could understand his grandmother was actually the nurse. And he said to himself, well, if the nurse can understand grandma, then we can teach technology to understand grandma and many people like her. So that's really how Voice It was born. And then he got another co-founder, Sarah Smalley, who also had a grandmother with Parkinson's who had difficulty communicating. Really, everyone can relate to this story because everyone knows someone who it's hard to communicate with because they're really hard to understand. So it's relatable. Oh yeah, definitely. Even as you were telling the story, I was like thinking about people from my own experience that it's a challenge sometimes to communicate back and forth. So that's definitely a relatable experience. So I know that VoiceIt has both the iOS app and a new web app. So I want to talk a little bit about both. But first, let's just talk about the existing iOS app. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. So the iOS app, that's what it is, right? It's it's an app that's downloadable on the iOS app store. So any Apple handheld device can utilize this technology. It essentially serves two functions. One is communication with others, and the other is smart home control. We do have an integration with Alexa, that allows this kind of seamless communication between the app and Amazon's servers. So to really kind of enhance this smart home control, it's quite seamless and integrated. And the iOS app also can be used pretty much right out of the box. So essentially, when an individual onboards to the app, they can train just one phrase. Once they train it and they unlock it, they can use it right away. And that being said, individuals do need to use the phrases that they've pre-trained. So every phrase needs to be pre-trained for individuals to be able to use them. But there is a hidden gem about this application, which will allow individuals to say shorter words or even syllables, and the app will extend their speech and language. So for example, If someone wants to say the word burger and they'll train the word burger, we can actually program the app to output, I'd like a cheeseburger with pickles and tomatoes, please. And we know that these individuals who have limited speech and language, generally their caregivers know exactly what they want, right? Their caregivers know that when they say burger, they don't like onions. And so they're going to order the burger without onions. And What's great about this application is it becomes the familiar listener and it actually communicates 
what the individual really intends to say. That's pretty impressive. So how does that differ from the new web app that's in beta mode right now? So the web app is a totally different product and it's accessible via the web. So basically any device that has internet access and can open a web browser can utilize this technology. And this technology is what we call spontaneous speech recognition so that individuals who speak spontaneously will have their words be written on the screen and also read aloud through an automated kind of voice and a synthesized speech. And essentially for people to get to have access to this, they need to train a thousand phrases. And once they do that, they will have, the tool will unlock and they'll have access to two modes of the, of the application, which will allow them to either use conversation mode or dictation mode. The web app also has really cool integrations. So we have an integration with Zoom and Microsoft Teams for live transcriptions during video conference calls. And there's also the ability to choose output voices as well as we have a handy dandy share button, which will integrate with other applications. So one of my coworkers who is the QA specialist, Michael, he's kind of the star of the show on many of our YouTube videos. He uses it very often to write WhatsApp messages. So he uses it on his phone and he dictates a message and then uses the share button to literally, he presses like two buttons and it already shares it to whoever he chooses from his contact list. And so that's a really, really nice feature. The great thing about the web app also is most recently we've opened up the beta to children. And so children under 13 can now participate And the opportunities for them in the academic setting is really endless. And individuals with speech impairment, we serve the gamut of speech impairments, really. But I can imagine that children with even minor articulation issues who are just not able to access regular speech-to-text technology can utilize VoiceIt for engagement in their academics, especially for children with dyslexia or any other type of learning disability, which will generally prevent them or inhibit them from writing. This can now help them kind of extrapolate their ideas and get their ideas out without adult assistance. So essentially giving people greater independence, whether that be in their academic environment, in their work environment, in their personal lives. That's really what Voice It's here to do, to give individuals with speech impairments greater independence in in those arenas. That was exactly the example I was thinking about as you were talking about the web app. I was thinking about my students who had both dyslexia and had a speech impairment. And the default was always, well, you can voice type. And then the voice typing that was built into their device could not pick up what they were saying. It was super frustrating for them. So I love that this is something that they could use instead of having, like you said, an an adult scribe having to sit there and type out everything that they're saying out loud, they have that increased independence, which is really great. Just on that note, I'm really excited that we're offering this to kids because I think that oftentimes individuals with disabilities have learned helplessness. And the learned helplessness begins from the very beginning of their life, right? And what Voice It's doing is allowing individuals to have this paradigm shift. Sometimes as adults, it's really hard to break that cycle. And so if we could get in early when these kids are just developing and just kind of understanding their sense of self and their capabilities and what they can do in the world and what they can offer the world, we've really allowed that paradigm shift to happen earlier and more seamlessly. That's a great point. I really do appreciate that I did notice that cycle when I was a teacher, you know, coming in from elementary school, they're used to a lot of 
hand holding support hand over hand and then getting into middle school and wanting them to be a little more independent was always a challenge so I like that you're trying to get it in a little bit earlier so that can happen sooner and they can feel that sense of empowerment and independence as they're working which is really special I just want to make sure I have a clear distinction on the difference between the two. We want to make sure for my listeners. So the iOS app that you download to an iPhone device and the web app is accessible anywhere that has internet access. Were there any other distinctions between the two that I missed? I'd love to highlight that for you because it is kind of confusing since both our products essentially help individuals with non-standard speech be able to communicate. So essentially the iOS app with regard to expressive language, does not require a very robust language. So individuals with limited language, maybe individuals who speak in one word utterances or who have really severe speech impairment can still utilize our iOS app. However, the web app does require a bit more robust language. It requires that individuals speak in full sentences because it is a spontaneous speech recognition technology. With regard to pronunciation, Across the board, we do require that individuals have consistent errors. So yes, their speech is impaired, but the errors should be consistent so that our technology can essentially learn the error patterns and create a model based on the individual's speech patterns. And then with regard to severity, the iOS app really covers the gamut of speech severity. So anywhere between mild to profound speech impairment can utilize our iOS app technology, while the web app is better suited for individuals with mild to moderate speech impairment. And then with regard to social skills with the web app, individuals really should be quite motivated to use technology for the purposes of communication, while the iOS app allows for greater flexibility so that individuals who are maybe less skilled socially can still utilize our iOS technology for communication as well as for smart home control. And then with regard to internet access, the iOS app does require internet for the use of smart home as well as for training of the phrases. However, once phrases are built into the system and there's a library, individuals can take the iOS app into the community and use the pre-trained phrases without having access to the internet. While the web app does require constant internet access. With both, with both technologies, we're open to all ages. Anyone under the age of 13 does require parental consent. So that will be given to parents to sign and send to us. And both technologies are also free. Currently, the iOS app We are not planning any monetization. However, the web app, we are planning to monetize in the second quarter of 2023. And currently we're offering the beta testers. So anyone who wants to get in early, beta testers will have access to our technology, the spontaneous speech technology for free during beta and for one year post monetization. That's good to know. So if anybody yeah. wants to take to try it out in beta mode, that's a good incentive to to take the opportunity to try it out. Exactly. Thank, thank you for highlighting those distinctions too. That was very clear cut. As people want to integrate or try out this technology, you've made it very clear which one is probably likely the one that they need to try out. Sure. And actually just, I wanted to add one more thing. The iOS app is completely hands-free. So individuals can access it just by voice. We have a wake word for interpersonal communication. And we have, obviously, there's a wake word for Alexa, which is already there. They don't need to say Alexa exactly the way any standard speaker would. They can say it their way and we'll learn the way they say it. And that's fine. The web app does require some dexterity with regard to accessing. So it does require some clicks. That being said, we're easily integrated with any sort of accessibility switch. So that's always a possibility, but it isn't completely hands-free like the iOS app. That's good to know. It's good that it's all, the web app is also available for like switch technologies and things like that, but that's really cool that the iOS is fully hands-free. I'm sure that makes it a lot easier for people to access. We actually have users who use both technologies. So one of our beta testers, she's kind of a rock star. Her name is Dr. Claire Malone. You can look her up. She's a particle physicist and also an inclusion consultant. 
and she uses our web app daily for emails and she's actually using it to write her sci-fi oh. novel. And she also uses our iOS app for smart home control. So, you know, individuals can use both technologies. That's cool. I didn't even think to ask about if anybody was using both. So that's a great example of how you could really utilize the full functionality of both apps within daily life. I did yeah. want to ask about, because I always like to jump to the technology side, but how does the software use machine learning or specific algorithms to actually recognize and learn the person's unique speech patterns? I'm not really a technologist. I'm a speech language pathologist. But my general understanding is that we essentially build a model based on the individual speech pattern. So every time someone records a phrase, the machine learning essentially understands that this is how they're going to say it and this is how I'm going to translate it. And each time an individual trains the model, it improves the learning. That being said, we don't only base our model on one individual, it's based on loads and loads of data, right? So it's really based on how standard voice recognition has developed. And that is they took millions of recordings of standard speakers and built this model, which essentially can understand standard speakers. And that's what we're doing now. We're building a model of non-standard speech. So we're collecting yeah, voice data from our beta testers and essentially building this database so that eventually our technology will be on par with standard voice recognition, which doesn't require any training, right? You can yeah. just pick up your Siri and off the bat, use it. And that's the goal here for Voiceit as well, that it won't require training because with more and more data, we will essentially be able to reduce the amount of training required to actually get a functional usable tool. That's really cool. So eventually somebody might be able to pick up voice it and just jump right into it without having to have that training. Once you have that substantial database. of Sure. That, that's the hope. That's the hope that we can get <laughs> enough voice data to make that happen. That's really exciting because most voice recognitions, they're not pulling from people who don't have, as you had said, like non-standard speech patterns. So it's great that there's this profile almost being built with everybody who has participated so far. I did want to talk about the data collected specifically. So as they are using VoiceIt, those recordings of their speech patterns, those are being kind of compiled into that profile and that database. Yes, exactly. I know this is often a concern with regard to data privacy. We are HIPAA compliant and COPA compliant and every internet security organization compliant. And all of our recordings are saved and basically are applied to our database to improve our technology. But everything is de-identified. So any identification is separate from the actual recordings. So you know that we're, we're really compliant with all of those uh, security issues. That's always good to know. I know that's especially since now the younger students are able to use it with parent permission or if they're 13 or older. That's something I'm sure a lot of schools will be really thrilled to hear. That's always a big concern is data privacy. So that's great that that extra precaution is being taken to kind of separate people from their recordings. Sure. So if a person wanted to get started using VoiceIt, like if they just want to pick up their phone right now and start using it, they download the app in the iOS case and they would be presented with the opportunity then to train the app? Is that how they would kind of go about getting started? So with regard to getting started with the iOS app, they can just simply download it and begin training. You can literally use it out of the box because you can train one phrase and already begin using it. So mm -hmm. for example, if you download the app and train, hello, how are you? You just need to say that five times and you don't even need to say, hello, how are you? You can just have the output be, hello, how are you? You can just, you can do hello and then it will output, hello, how are you? The, the possibilities are endless, but let's say for simplicity's sake, individuals want to train the word hello. They'll say the word hello five times 
that will unlock the phrase and then they can use it. And the app will automatically translate their speech into automated speech that's synthesized and also written on the screen. That's essentially the iOS app. The web app, however, does require a little bit of work on the outset. So individuals do need to train a thousand phrases in advance of receiving the tool. And then once they unlock it, they'll have access. But the recognition may not be 100%. And that all depends on the individual speech patterns. So that being said, a thousand phrases will unlock the tool, but more training may be required to get the tool to be kind of up to par with expectations. That makes sense. So there's a little bit of a training difference between the two, but that makes sense because you had mentioned that the web app was people who had more of a mild speech issue potentially. So that makes sense that they require yeah, mild more. to moderate, mild yeah. to moderate. Yeah. So it makes sense that there might be a little bit more training or voice recognition practice required on that. So you had given a couple examples of how people have been kind of using the app in their daily lives. We talked about how they were using the integration with their smart homes, but what have been some of the most popular ways that you've seen either the web app or the iOS app being used in people's daily lives? I did mention Dr. Claire Malone. She's using it to write emails. She has an assistant, but now she has greater flexibility in being able to write emails without having her assistant present. And also since she's a creative person and she's writing this sci-fi novel, when inspiration strikes, she doesn't need to wait for her assistant to be present. She can do it on her own independently. And we also have uh, another individual who had had a stroke who uses Voiceit mainly for phone calls, actually. Though the Voiceit web app can't be used on the same device for a phone call, he actually uses Voiceit running on a separate device, makes a call on his phone, and then uses Voiceit synthesized speech output to microphone input of his phone to communicate with companies and any other individuals who wouldn't otherwise understand him. So that gives him greater flexibility to be able to make phone calls and kind of run his own errands, so to speak, without having the assistance of an individual with standard speech who understands him and then translates for him. We also have kiddos now using our technology. So we have a teen who's using this to write essays and participate more in his classroom environment. And really the possibilities are endless. We have individuals with ALS who are using this for communication. We have individuals who have undergone head and neck surgery due to cancer, which has impaired their speech. We have an individual who has Down syndrome, who is just the most lively young lady and has so much to say and so much to give. But up until now, no one was able to understand her. And now she's able to communicate with unfamiliar listeners. And I think the greatest part about it for her is she knows how to read. Reading and writing is difficult for her. But now she can actually write emails and she can write text messages and she can actually compose those messages on her own independently. So that's given her greater flexibility and independence in her life. I love the wide variety of ways that people are using it. I think that shows how impactful it is in so many facets of people's lives, which is pretty incredible, but also the independence part. That's just so huge because it's difficult. I feel like especially with personal emails and things like that to like have somebody be the intermediary barrier, like, okay, I'm going to help you write this personal email, but now they have the ability to take care of things themselves, whether it's like you had mentioned the example of, you know, taking care of your own errands without having to have somebody translate back and forth for you. I'm sure that's really empowering for everybody who's been using voice it. It's really inspiring for me to be able to witness the transformation for people. And like I said earlier, it does require a paradigm shift and for people to bring in this technology into their life and actually have it change it requires a lot of time and effort on their part to remember, oh, wait, I don't need to rely upon my caregiver for this. I could actually do this on my own. And that sometimes requires the help of therapists. And so voice it doesn't, it is not there to replace 
the therapist, but rather is a tool for therapists to use to give their clients greater independence and more ownership over their life and their communication. So we definitely need therapists and teachers to help us bring voice it into people's lives and have people really have buy-in and adopt it and really bring it into their lives to help them change their life. That's a great point. Those roles are still obviously absolutely necessary, but we can still, you know, have that support while they're using the tool, but still give them that empowerment in their daily lives. That's really incredible. So I know that you're still in the beginning phases and the beta testing of the app, the web app specifically, but what lessons have you learned so far from testing out that web app? We have learned that individuals who are part of the beta have actually requested certain features and we're listening. So Claire Malone, who's actually one of our first beta testers, requested for the ability to add punctuation and the ability to move around the text on the screen. So we actually have voice commands for that now. So individuals can say comma, and it will write a comma, question mark, period, new line, and the text will move down to the new line. So she can actually compose an email that looks like an email, right? And all by voice. One of the great kind of things about being in this beta is that your suggestions actually play a role in shaping the technology. I love beta mode of everything in general for that reason. It's always so great to hear what people's feedback is and what other people want to see. And it's great that voice it is actively listening to and accepting and implementing in those cases, those features to make it even more powerful than it already is. I did want to ask about the biggest successes so far. So whether it's from the iOS app or from your web-based app, what do you think the biggest successes of Voiceit have been? I think the biggest success for us is actually giving people the ability to communicate and use their own voice and be able to be independent in their life. That was the mission originally of Voiceit was to give individuals the ability to communicate for themselves. Oftentimes, individuals with speech impairments are relegated to the typical AAC technology for their communication needs. And sadly, they're often resistant because they consider themselves verbal speakers and they want to be verbal speakers. So I think that's a great success for us to be able to give individuals their voice That's a perspective that I hadn't considered about AAC devices in some cases. So what about the future of Voice It? What can we expect for the future? (laughs) So like I mentioned earlier, we have Zoom integration and a Microsoft Teams integration for live transcriptions during video calls. We actually recently had an investment by Cisco and we are now rolling out very, very soon a WebEx integration for live transcriptions of those calls on that platform. We're also looking into the future, adding a Google Chrome extension, which will actually allow individuals to use voice technology through any Google webpage item, right? Whether that be another webpage that they're trying to type into or Google Doc or Gmail. I mean, the possibilities are endless there. And then looking further into the future, the possibilities for voice recognition technology for people with impaired speech will actually enable them to control their PC, so PC control. And for these individuals, many of which have dexterity and physical limitations, that can be a real game changer. Oh, yeah, that'll be huge to be able to solely rely on their voice to be able to operate everything on their computer, that would really impact people's lives. And I'm really excited about the Chrome extension because through my whole career as an educator, all we used was Chromebooks. (laughs) So anytime something is able to be used right away, I'm like, oh, perfect. And of course, the web app is accessible on a Chromebook now, but the Chrome extension just adds that extra bit of breeziness or just really, really speeding up the process. And it's great too, because then the students can get used to the web app now 
because it's available and they can use it on their, I know so many schools are using Chromebooks on their device. And then when that extension comes out, there's not a lag time in learning how to use something because they've already gotten to learn to use it through the web app. Well, I'm looking forward to continuing to hear about all the continued updates and successes that come along with Voice It and all the great work that's being done. So I just want to thank you so much, Rachel, for being here with us today. Thanks, Katie. Would it be okay if I played a little clip for our audience to hear some of our web app users, our ambassadors, we call them, who have kind of we put together this Happy New Year message, and I'd love to share it with your audience. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll play that right now. And then also for anybody who wants to take out, check out the video part of it, we'll, we'll link it in the show notes as well. But let's definitely take a listen. Yeah, and just to give a little context here, so it is a video, and most of the users on here have chosen to play the voice output. One of them does not like to use voice output. He likes to use his own voice. And so the the text is on the screen. So anyone who'd like to check out the actual video is welcome to do that. Okay, here it is. How does the Happy New Year to all. We in the New Year Communication. Wishing you a year. Oh, and send me baby. Of accessibility. Wishing you all a year filled with poetry and creativity. Wishing you all a year filled with poetry and creativity. Wishing you a year of goodwill. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year! Perfect. And I'm going to make sure to link that for everybody, just in case you want to check out what it looks like from the video side as well. But even just hearing how voice it picks up the speech is just really incredible. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. Thank you so much again for sharing. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembling Inclusion podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new, gave you a new idea, or showcased a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.